Today I have with me Professor Prabhat Patnaik and those of you who are new to this channel would have read about him, heard about him. If you haven't then it's, I would say that you've been uneducated. <laughs> I'll tell you why because we are all used to listening to only mainstream neoliberal economists who, tell, who tell us privatization is great, the public sector is terrible, subsidies are very bad, deficits are terrible, they must be kept under control, inflation is horrible. Yes, yeah, some of these are probably true, but from the, the reason why neoliberal mainstream economists tell you that is very different. And I want to explore that with Professor Patnaik. And uh, you'll have to excuse us because we, are, we have got this hot coffee here, which we will be <laughs> sipping every now and then. But uh, uh, Professor Patnaik, let me start by asking you. One of the things that I think all of us, when we study textbooks, economics textbooks, whether it's in school or whether in college or out of our hobby, and actually because of the way in which the media tells us what the economy should be like, we think that actually everyone in our country can achieve riches if they want to. Right? Everyone can, be, um, can become rich if they work hard and if we have all that the West has. Right? But most of us somehow know that's not true. I want to ask you this question. What is India like? Who rules India? Who decides what the economic policies are going to be like? And by who, I mean, what are the groups of people? Well, you know, I suppose at the present moment, India is ruled by an alliance between the Hindutva forces led mm. by Narendra Modi and the corporate elements led by Adani and, and, and Ambani. Okay. I mean, I would call it a sort of corporate Hindutva alliance, mm. uh, which is, as it were, personified in a Modi-Adani alliance mm. that actually rules India. Mm. So, now, and, but, yeah. but, but you see, obviously, when I say it rules India, it must have sufficient social support. Yes. I think the social support comes partly, of course, from ordinary people, many of whom mm. either because of this false economics that is fed to them mm. or because of being motivated communally mm. because communalism is also fed to them, mm. uh, go along with it. But I think a segment which is very articulate and goes along with it is the middle class, particularly mm. the well-to-do middle class. Mm. I think the well-to-do middle class has done quite well out of neoliberalism mm. and its opportunities have expanded mm. because of which it is really a votary of neoliberalism mm. and the corporate Hindutva alliance is in fact an alliance which promotes neoliberalism. Mm. Therefore, it has substantial support from a segment of the middle class, basically the upper segment of the middle mm. class. And when we say middle class, often we tend to believe that this is those who are not very rich, but not are poor. But in Indian c conditions, the middle class is more a concept. It's a yes. more a theoretical concept. Could you explain that yes. a little? I mean, I, I, when I say middle class, I don't have in mind uh, let's say university professors mm. or uh, people in clerical jobs in the government and so mm. on whom the salariate, I mean, mm. I basically mm. by middle class, we generally refer to the salariate. And I think the majority of the salariate would really belong to the lower middle class. Yeah. Mm. They are not the people who are great votaries yeah. of, of, of this alliance mm. I'm talking about. But the upper middle class, including, mm. if I may say so, people in the media. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I agree. I, 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 I think they are the ones, you know, executives in yes. business houses mm. and, and company executives and so on, mm. people in the media. Mm. They are the people who actually uh, are, are, are more or less supporting in this alliance. Do you see that in some senses that uh, there is almost a fear that the upper middle class or the rich, if I had to say, mm -hmm. in Indian context, have of... Uh, of anything that speaks of socialism, anything that speaks of equality. Yes. It's almost a fear. It's almost, yes. Yes. it's almost a sense that, no, 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 that's all been disproved. It's all been, it's wrong. Why yes. are you bringing this up? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. This middle class is really obsessed with the fear mm. of socialism. Any 
turn to the left mm. in policy making and so on. But there is also a reason for it. You see, this middle class has done well out of neoliberalism. Mm. Now, if you do well out of neoliberalism, and the question, most people have not done well. In fact, a large number of people are really worse off, according to me. Certainly, if you look at nutritional data, they are worse off today mm. than they were at the end of the 1980s. Mm. So, if some people are better off, mm. then naturally, question would be raised, why are they better off? Mm. So their self-perception is that they are better off because they are more talented. Yeah. They are not going to say that they are mm. better off because they, had, they, they come from mm. uh, better, you know, mm. better endowed families or anything of that kind. They are better off than the Dalit. They mm. are better off than the laborer's child. They are mm. better off than the kind of, you know, uh, worker's child or peasant child because they are more talented. Mm. And therefore, there is a self-perception that, 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 that goes along with it, which mm. says that in capitalism, everybody has the opportunity to do well. Yeah. Uh, those who don't is because they're not sufficiently talented. So I would bring a, you know, I would bring a slight, uh, not disagreement, but I would say a, a, a little bit of an additional thing here. I think that the middle class that we're talking about, that there's... Uh, the executives, the mm. professional right. classes, not exactly. owners of capital directly. Exactly. exactly. These people have actually not done well in the last 10 years. I'll tell you why. Since the global financial crisis of 2008-9, if you look at salaries, they've more or less, they've not go, gone up if you look at it, if you compare it to inflation. It's more or less stuck there and very few except for banks, people in banks and stuff like that. If you look at IT, if you look at media, for instance, these have absolutely stagnated. So that I look around me, people my age, I'm now going to be 51, and I see that many people around my age 10 years ago who were really affluent and who thought that, okay, we are only going to get richer and richer, have seen a decline. And that's the professional class, I'm saying. Despite that, despite that, their conviction about free market policies doesn't change. You know, I, I believe that there is, you're absolutely right about this, this, this stagnation or mm. even decline. But that, I think, is because of crisis of neoliberalism. Mm. I think neoliberalism, which was doing very well, started getting into a crisis starting from the financial crisis that mm. occurred. Uh, after the financial crisis, in large numbers of countries, certainly in Europe, and even in India, uh, over the last 10 years, uh, things have been pretty bad, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. uh, for the economy as a whole. And yeah. I think the middle class <clears throat> is not insulated from it. Mm -hmm. If you look at the period before neoliberalism began and compare it to now, they are distinctly much better off. Mm -hmm. But it yeah. is certainly yeah, yeah, true. Absolutely. It's absolutely. certainly true that in the yeah. last decade or so, mm -hmm. uh, particularly after 2012, 2013, they have actually experienced a stagnation decline in their living standards. Now, at some point, one hopes that that is what would induce segments of them to mm. change their views. Mm. Because after all, you know, I mean, it does happen that people from the dominant classes, particularly the youth and, and you know, I mean, more intellectually inclined elements uh, from those classes, then uh, take on an oppositional role. And yes. when that happens, mm. that is the time for social change. Mm. Mm. Like when you were young, I guess. Like when I was young. Yeah. But, but see, interesting is that, you know, interesting thing is that, you know, that if you look at the anti-colonial struggle, mm. a very large number of people involved in the anti-colonial struggle, I'm talking about the mm. articulate leadership positions, mm. or, you know, those who occupied such positions, they actually were landlord's children. Yes. And, and mm. you know, they, 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 they actually joined political forces that were at Attacking landlordism, mm, mm. and and so so at some point, I think many of these are going to change. But when you were young, you were fighting the Congress, right? Yes, absolutely. Mm. For us, Congress was the enemy, mm. betraying mm. the promise of the anti-colonial struggle. Mm. My father was a communist, mm. so so mm. Mm. Okay. not very so, surprising. Yeah, yeah. In fact, things like BJP. I come from Orissa, things mm. like BJP never entered the picture. Mm. Mm. We used to hear of them, something called Jansang in North mm. India, of Rajasthan and such like places, but they were a marginal phenomenon. Now, 
RSS was not, yes. but, but the political element mm. called Jansang, mm. I think in the first parliament election, they probably got four seats or mm. something like that. And I think for till the 1980s, Jansang had about 6-7% at its peak exactly. and that's what the BJP yeah. ended up with yeah. in the 1980 elections. The, too. the struggle we saw was mm. between the Congress and the left. Mm. Congress and the left. But uh, no, the reason I asked you this question is because uh, I'm sure you had friends and uh, you know, in, in college or in university who did not come from communist backgrounds. They no, came from, but absolutely. they were turning left. Yes. Yes. Right? Oh, absolutely. Right. Yes, there was yes, a, but yes. that kind of dissolved at one particular time in the 80s. Probably yes, yes. has to do with the, the collapse of the Soviet Union also. How, how important in this context is public culture? And I'm asking you as an economist, how important is uh, media in creating a consensus at that time, was the was the media was public culture were public intellectuals in your time uh, more I would say with the people than it is today. Oh, absolutely! In fact, I think for a very long time, the middle class, including those who were executives and so on, mm. uh, they were part of this narrative mm. of public sector of. Uh, uh, you know, some kind of a mixed economy, mm -hmm. uh, standing up to the United yeah. States in mm -hmm. foreign policy, and so on. I think uh, that was really, uh, I mean, I think uh, the economist Mikhail Kalitsky has this interesting idea of an intermediate regime, yeah. in yeah. which he believes that really it was a regime dominated by the middle class. The Nehruvian regime mm -hmm. was a regime that was dominated by the middle class. Mm. And the two main features of that regime were non-alignment mm. and what he called state capitalism, which mm -hmm. was basically mm -hmm. uh, emphasis What on you the, call dirigis. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Emphasis yeah. on the public sector. So, mm. so, but you see, that was, a, that was not just the culture in India. That mm. was actually the culture all over the world. Yeah. There was a Soviet Union on one side, but if mm. you look at Europe, uh, Europe, for instance, there was social democracy, yeah. pursuing Keynesian policies. And in I think the, the Labour Party, till the coming of Blair, had the uh, Clause uh, 5 or something, yeah, 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 which yeah, said yeah. nationalization yeah. is the... That's right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, so, so nationalization was, of course, an objective. But what is more, the idea of full employment, mm. or as, as close to full employment as mm. you can get, the idea of a welfare fair state, these were commonly accepted ideas and if you did not believe in them, people would look at you yeah. as if you had dropped from another mm. planet. I think it began to change. I, I, I believe the, it, the collapse of the Soviet Union was, if you like, the, the, the last straw. Yeah, but, but it began in the late that, 70s yes, exactly. itself. Exactly. Right? I think it began with the crisis of Keynesianism, the crisis of Dirigism, mm. uh, which was there, you know, let us say, in, in, in the late 70s. How, yeah. how, how important, uh, I know we're jumping around, but this is an adda. So <laughs> <laughs> that's how it happened. Yeah. So how important the collapse of Keynesianism and if you could, before I uh, go, uh, I'm asking this question, but if you could spend two minutes just for our viewers to explain what Keynesianism is and then take yeah. it up. The collapse of Keynesianism, how accidental was it? And I'm asking this, how important was uh, the wars in the Middle East, the oil shock and these, how important were they and how important... How inherent was this collapse likely to be? How That this was bound to happen at some point? Yes, I, I believe it was bound to happen. It yeah. was not just the uh, oil shocks and so on. Mm. You see, fundamentally, Keynesianism believed that you could stabilize capitalism. And Keynes was anti-communist. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Mm. He really wanted capitalism to continue. But on the other hand, precisely because he was anti-communist, his idea was that unless the flaws of capitalism are overcome, mm. communists are going to take over. Yeah. Therefore, it's mm. very important mm. that the flaws be overcome. Mm. And this, he thought, could be done through state intervention. Mm. This, and, and the biggest flaw was unemployment, so, mm. so because he was writing in, during the Great Depression and mm. so on. So, so he thought that state intervention could push capitalism towards full employment. And if that was the case, with the biggest flaw of capitalism overcome, there was no reason mm. for, for anyone to turn to socialism. Mm. Uh, 
but the problem was that I believe that you know it was it was bound to fail because I think a capitalist system operating close to full employment is really an impossibility mm -hmm. in the long run. I mm -hmm. mean, you, you can have it for a certain mm -hmm. period of time, but but not eventually, because typically it gets then to. A, a situation of inflation. Inflation. That's yeah. right. Plus also, which is what happened. Which plus is exactly also, what it happened. ultimately also leads to a drop in profits, right? For the capital. If one looks at the yes, share yes. of profit, yes. then till the 70s, one sees that the, actually the top 1% yes, right. actually are at their bottom in the US or UK or even India. Yes. And then they start rising from 1980s. Absolutely, onwards, because, yeah. you know, if you are moving towards a more egalitarian yes, order, then, yeah. of course, the, the top 1% or 10% would be worse off than they were to start with. Mm. And to some extent, they try to overcome it by jacking up prices, mm. because even inflation is yeah. because of that. Yes. Uh, but, but not fully, because, mm. after all, you know, uh, you can jack up prices only to a certain extent, but mm. not otherwise. And therefore, you have a combination of a decline in profit margins mm. and an inflation. And on top of that came the oil shocks and... Stuff. Yes, you see, what happened was that in the early 1970s, there was... Okay, I mean, there were a whole lot of interrelated things. In yeah. the late 1960s, there was a worldwide wage explosion, mm. okay? Mm. Uh, when the worldwide wage explosion obviously then uh, gave rise to a situation where there was a worldwide primary commodity price explosion mm. in the early 1970s. Mm. Now, when that happens, uh, the, you know... The and was the world less globalized at that time, post-decolonization, uh, where primary commodities... I mean, today, if there's a wage explosion, then you go to Africa. Right? <laughs> but, uh, was that no, no, an issue? No, 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 no it, was, it was not that they went to Africa, <laughs> but the wage explosion mm. is something which occurred. Because it's not, even though you had the, um, I mean, you know, you, the Vietnam War mm. basically meant a lot of printing of dollars to finance it. Mm -hmm. That created some excess demand pressures because mm. of which there was some increase in prices. Not really an inflationary crisis, mm. but an onset of an inflation mm. because of which the working class lost out a bit. So mm. they tried to make up for it mm. by demanding higher wages. You had mm. a worldwide wage explosion in the late 1960s, let's say 68 or thereabouts. Then that got converted into a worldwide primary commodity price explosion which lasted for some time and, mm. and and that got aggravated because the dollar had had by by that time uh, the Bretton Woods system collapsed the mm. dollar ceased to be uh, the kind of you know uh, as, as good as gold mm. uh, currency that mm. was recognized by everybody to be so so there was some uncertainty and a lot of uh, speculators moved to primary commodities as mm. a means of holding their wealth. Mm. Therefore, you had a primary commodity price explosion. Mm. When that collapsed, I mean, obviously that explosion couldn't last for, for a very long time. When that collapsed and, you know, fears got settled as it were, mm. Mm. Uh, oil prices did not collapse because mm. the oil producers had mm. organized themselves into an mm. OPEC mm. and they did not allow the price to collapse. On mm. the contrary, they jacked it up. Mm. So, so the oil price hike came on the back of a primary commodity price, price explosion. Hike. Yeah. yeah, okay, okay. All right. I'm going to now jump again a little bit forward because I want to just get a sense as to... Uh, now, if one looks at uh, India, we have the 70s, we have emergency. Indira Gandhi gets defeated after that. There are certain um, social coalitions which coalesce. So if one looks at it, Indira Gandhi actually did extremely well in 1977 in the South. Right. right? Mm. More or less swept mm. almost everything. Mm. The North is where she gets defeated. Then comes back in 1980. Right. right. And there's a bit of a crisis. So she goes to take a loan. And from then on, from 1982 onwards, the first beginnings of these so-called reform start. Right, right, right. You've been through that place, uh, space from being a teacher, looking at, analyzing. What did you sense at that time? What is changing around you? And over the entire 80s, I would say, till 
Because you probably had a sense that things are changing, right? Yes, yes. Uh, well, I mean, two things were happening. The first, of course, at, at an intellectual level, uh, Thatcherism mm. emerged, you know, Thatcher and Reagan and so on, uh, which for the first time very clearly articulated a position different from, not only on the Labour Party, I mean, after all, even in the Conservative Party, Edward Heath, for instance, yeah. the British, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Edward Heath was completely opposed to the creation of unemployment as a way of beating down mm, inflation. Mm, mm. So, but, but Thatcher mm. pushed that line. Mm. So the whole idea that, you know, beat the trade unions, mm. create unemployment, therefore resolve inflation at the expense of the working class. Mm. This, this, this political position was intellectually adopted mm. by the right mm. and the right became powerful because there was an inflation yeah. okay yeah. the left solution to that inflation was to have an incomes policy mm. that mm. basically mm. okay you know i mean it fundamentally inflation is because different classes are competing mm. to maintain their shares mm. so let's have an agreement mm. And, and, and therefore have a prices and incomes mm. policy. Mm. They tried for a while, mm. Mm. but it didn't succeed. Mm. And uh, mind you, which would have meant uh, a tremendous intervention in the functioning of capitalism, yes. because capitalism yeah. doesn't, <laughs> doesn't function that way. Uh. Uh, so, 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 but the, but the right-wing solution was to generate unemployment and beat the workers, mm. which is what actually got... You, if you could uh, just explain to our viewers how that works. Just a very simple example. You see, the capitalist solution to inflation, which is being tried out even now, mm -hmm. is that if you have an inflation, what is inflation? Inflation is, let us say, prices are rising by, mm -hmm. by, by 10%. When prices rise by 10%, then the workers demand that they be compensated for the price rise. Mm -hmm. Money wages rise by 10% mm -hmm. to maintain the same real wages before. Mm -hmm. When money wages rise by 10%, costs have increased and yeah. therefore prices get further increased mm. by 10% mm. and so on. So that's called a wage price spiral. Mm. So mm. you have a wage price spiral which arises because of the fact that the workers are being compensated for the price rise. Okay. So if you can create unemployment, if you can, and beat, then the workers will be forced to accept uh, less yes, wages. Because the trade unions then mm. become weak because mm. you see, I yeah. mean, they, they, they can't go on a strike if mm. there's a huge amount of unemployment, mm. you know. So, so the point is that, you know, the typical capitalist solution in a, in a capitalist society, the typical solution to unemployment, uh, to, to, to inflation is to create unemployment through a recession. And reduce the demand of the working class. That's right. Yeah. You know, yeah. mm. their share, you know, yeah. so their the, share of the, the That's right. Yeah. And that's exactly what is being tried out now. Mm -hmm. When you say that we are going to uh, get, you know, curb inflation by raising interest rates. Now, what's the connection between interest rates and inflation? Yeah. Essentially, if you raise interest rates, mm. then demand comes down, aggregate demand. Therefore, unemployment is generated. Mm. And therefore, you actually have a solution, uh, solution in quotes to inflation. It reminds me of an interesting thing, because I remember speaking, uh, interviewing someone from the RBI many years ago, asking them that food prices are going up and that is causing inflation. How does interest increasing interest rate Reduce that inflation. Are people borrowing to eat? Because you've already banned exactly. for futures trading yeah, in yeah, food. So, yeah, yeah. so they said, no, no, no. It is inflation expectation. <laughs> the thing that you're talking about. That, yeah, yeah, that yeah, people yeah, might yeah. end up uh, asking for more money if, if inflation goes up. And that is what we have to curb. Yes. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, comes to mind from here is that that change... That happened. Yes. So the one was this sort of, you know, intellectual change that occurred. But the intellectual change was a result of the fact that the dirigist regimes, both in the West as well as in, in India, had got into a sort of contradiction. I mean, had, had, had got into a dead end. Yeah. You know, in the West, it was the inflation. 
Here again, I suppose the middle class had grown. There were not enough job opportunities being created. Mind you, rate of growth of employment in that regime was higher than it is yes, today. Yeah. But nonetheless, the feeling that time was mm. that if we open up the economy and so on, they, we mm. would have greater opportunities, which is true mm. for the prosperous middle class, for the professionals mm. and so on, because capital comes in and so on. Uh, but on the other hand, not for the bulk of the population. Mm. But this impression was created because I think that regime had run into a kind of dead end. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that, if I, uh, you know, one goes back and watches these documentaries, suddenly Friedman, Hayek, these people became heroes. Mm -hmm. And actually, if you look at their work, they're not of the quality of, you know, with due mm -hmm. respects to economists. As, an, as a non-economic student, as a student of history, when I look at their writing, it seems quite banal sometimes <laughs> to me. Hey, I, I'm probably being unfair here, but, compared, but they became these big heroes. And there was no space left. And if I look at the 90s in India or the 2000s, there was no space left for a counter voice at all. Oh, How uh, organized uh, was this, uh, according to you? Well, you know, I mean, f the, the two names you mentioned, mm. Hayek and Friedman, mm. What is common between the two, and in fact to the entire right-wing economic thinking, is that they believe that in a capitalist system there is no involuntary unemployment. Mm. That the capitalist system functions at full employment, but full employment... Provided you could give one rupee wage. <laughs> <laughs> but, because but, one rupee someone might work. Full <laughs> employment is, is what they call, uh, you know... Uh, a natural rate of unemployment. Yeah. In yeah. other words, there's a certain amount of frictional mm. unemployment. There's a job waiting. I don't mm. know. It takes me some time to get to that job. Mm. That's basically Or I it. don't want to work. I don't. That's, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Voluntary yeah. unemployment, yeah. yes. Yeah. Frictional unemployment, There is the lack yes. of... Is a lack, lack of information. information yeah. yeah. So, so, so their solution to unemployment is not a, a, a increasing aggregate demand, mm. but in fact improving information flows. Mm. Now, the point is that that kind of thing, Keynesian economics had destroyed, mm -hmm. obliterated. Mm. You know, uh, but on the other hand, that made a comeback. Mm. You know, the point you mentioned about inflationary expectations. I just want to slightly go back to that. You see, mm. that that those who say inflationary expectations are going to be beaten, mm. their thinking is that it is all at the psychological mm. level. Mm. That we raise the interest rate, people think that inflation is going to come down yeah. and it comes down. But I think Mm. There is an additional factor, namely, it actually weakens the bargaining strength of the workers. Mm. You mm. know, so it actually weakens their capacity to raise money wages. Mm. So, so while inflationary expectations do play a role mm. in 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 exacerbating inflation and so on, but but fundamentally, it means a shift in the class balance. In some ways, when they say that if you raise interest rates, inflation will go down and people expect inflation to go down, they assume they know this thing. <laughs> you ask an average person, they have no idea. Exactly. <laughs> so, exactly. But, uh, you know, I, the reason I was asking you about how organized was this, because if one goes back and looks at, looks at it, and I'm not, going, I'm not saying any conspiracy theory no, no, or anything no, like no. that, right? Because, yeah. But there seems to be an organized entry of the certain sections of the yes. global capitalist class uh, yeah, taking yeah. over public discourse gradually yes, yes, and yes. weeding out anything which is against yes, it. Yes, that, that's absolutely true. But you see, right from the beginning, hmm. when Keynes did his general theory, hmm. there was a lot of opposition to it from the city of London, which yeah, is the yeah. center of British finance capital. Hmm, hmm. Now, therefore, finance capital was always opposed mm. to Keynesian policies. Mm. Keynes himself thought that this, is, this opposition is because of lack of knowledge. Mm. He thought that over a period of time mm. when they get to understand my theory, mm. because after all his theory was to save capitalism, mm. they would overcome their objections to mm. it. But in fact, there is a specific opposition of finance mm. to all these policies yes. that actually uh, uh, raise, uh, uh, I mean, you know, reduce unemployment and so on. This was there throughout. Mm. 
in the post-war period when social democracy was on the ascendancy, uh, finance was on the back foot. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, in the post-war period, uh, the working class was not going to take it lying down. Mm -hmm. They had come out in the war, made immense sacrifices. They don't mm -hmm. want to go back to the, yeah. to the interwar period mm -hmm. capitalism. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, if you remember, in the immediate post-war elections, Winston Churchill, Churchill lost, lost the yeah. election. Because he opposed the, and, you know, the NHS and things like that. That's right. Come I mean, through his that. views were very mm. right wing, yeah. except that during the war, mm. <laughs> you know, they had him mm. as prime minister, mm. but the working class hated Churchill. Mm. So he lost the election. So, so the point is that this was a period in which finance was on the back foot. Mm. Two things happened, of course, over a period of time, finance recouped its position and secondly, it got globalized. Mm. You see, this globalization began mm. because huge amounts of dollars poured into the European banks mm. and they were looking for places to go to. Mm. And therefore, uh, there was a lot of loan pushing to the third world. Mm. Uh, institutions like the IMF and the World Bank and so on were actually mobilized mm. to to kind of, you know, mm. take over the intellectual mm. discourse, you mm. know, uh, in, in, in many third mm. world countries. Mm. World Bank officials or IMF officials were put into critical positions within the IMF, I mean, sorry, within, within the within finance ministries, ministries yeah. of third world countries, mm. first in Africa. I mean, mm. Africa, the finance ministry itself was given an importance greater than any other ministry. Mm inside these mm. countries mm. so so it was really a, a, a you know assertion mm. of 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 finance of finance exactly yeah. mm. through institutions like mm. the IMF and mm. the World Bank mm. and so on but even otherwise through media through through uh, and uh, one has to say that it was done very uh, successfully and uh, yes at, at yes. times very subtly because I remember yeah, yeah. reading a piece that in the 80s uh, when Indira Gandhi took the loan and she came back and changed certain education policies mm -hmm. and some of them were under the instructions of the international institutions, right. which is focus on quantitative studies as opposed to qualitative I studies. See. Now, these are very interesting and yeah, subtle changes. Yeah. But coming back to now, how you know, one of the arguments that are made is that India was ruled by a uh, by a bureaucratic managerial class at one point, which uh, in mm -hmm. some ways is what would be called the middle class, which had a nationalist That's position, right, exactly. which uh, was in power, which had a kind of, um, I would say, collaborative uh, relationship with the uh, corporate world or the capitalist class, yeah. but mm -hmm. kind of ruled them That's right. in a sense. Yes. The, how did that change and how important is finance cap the emergence of finance capital in that? You know, there was a policy in India for mm. a very long time that employees of the World Bank and the IMF would not be employed by the government of India. Oh, yeah, it was, it yeah, was yeah, a policy. Yeah, absolutely. You know, in other words, if you are a World Bank employee, mm. it's another thing you kind of, you know, resigned and, mm. you know, suppose... I mean, I don't know in such a case, maybe it was possible, but mm. you cannot simply move from the World Bank and the mm. IMF mm. to the finance ministry in mm. India. Mm. And, and you mm. know, uh, that changed uh, roughly in the 70s. Oh, okay. It yeah. started yeah. in the 70s. It started uh -huh. in the 70s. I, I think... Uh, no, was it the 70s? Manmohan Singh was the finance minister. So, uh, Manmohan Singh finance minister would be 91. But no, before, before that, that, he was the RBI governor for a while. That would be also, 19, I think, 18. Mm. Yeah, maybe maybe late 1970s or something. Okay. I think oh. he was the economic advisor, yeah, the chief economic uh -huh. advisor. I, I think roughly around that period, mm. there was a change. Mm. And this was a complete shift from the old Nehruvian period, you mm. know. I mean, mm. uh, you simply could not shift from these institutions to the government of India, mm -hmm. okay. But that changed. And so, so the point is that, you know, this kind of a change was beginning to take place even before. Uh, you said 82 was the kind of, I think you are absolutely right, because mm -hmm. if you look at, it's quite interesting, you look at the growth of income inequality. Mm -hmm. It's 
just jump from exactly. 82, you 82 see, is because a, Piketty's figures yeah, show yeah. that in 1982, the top 1% of the population in India mm. had only 6% of the yeah, national income. Yeah. Today, they have 22% or mm. more, you know, so, so enormous. So, 82 was in some sense, or, you know, early 80s. I also said 82 80. because of Operation Forward, which Indira Gandhi, the first under no, 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 uh, no, no, Pranam no, Mukherjee, yeah, the changes yeah, that she yeah, did. Yeah. Uh, I want to come back to that Piketty question because it's an interesting thing. Because, but uh, uh, when when you look at the change that finance takes takes over, and in a sense that the government basically disenfranchises itself, right? The bureaucracy actually. I mean, yeah. I would imagine the bureaucrats want to rule and they want to control it. But from the '90s, you see that they let go increasingly yes. and hand over assets mm -hmm. to the corporate sector. Mm -hmm. right? And I, I, we've taken up a lot of your time. I want mm -hmm. you to kind of draw a kind of p connection between that change and the rise of right-wing politics. In you know, there's just one point which we have missed in this discussion. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. In societies like ours, I think uh, an additional point has to be kept in mind, namely this non-resident expatriate Indians, okay. mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. that was a very important, mm -hmm. I mean, when, you, you, you see, when Lenin wrote, mm -hmm. even when Keynes wrote, you mm -hmm. know, there was this general feeling that capitalism is on its last, last legs. legs. Mm -hmm. Now, the fact that in the post-war period, precisely because of Keynesian policies and so on, there was a big boom in capitalism, uh, because of which there was uh, a certain amount of migration from mm -hmm. third world countries like India and so mm -hmm. on to... From Punjab, to, for instance, uh, yeah, quite a yeah, bit. To, yeah, to, to, mm -hmm. to the US and mm -hmm. to Britain and, and so on, from India to those countries, from, mm -hmm. let's say, Turkey to Germany, from Algeria to France and mm -hmm. so on. I think that created a kind of, you know, a constituency mm. for these kinds of reforms, you yes. know, because after mm. all, I mean, mm. you know, it became at a certain point the desire of every middle class family mm. to send your children abroad, yeah. not just for higher education to come back, mm. but to settle down mm. abroad, mm. you know. Mm. So, so mm. The, I think that plays a very important role in mm. the in the shift to the right mm. and even in the strengthening of the BJP mm. And, mm. and political right, mm. because mm. many of them are really politically quite right wing. Mm. Yes. So, so, so how, how did the change in the class configuration? Uh, how important was the role of this bureaucratic managerial, let's say, class, the rule uh, there in keeping the idea of dirigism going and, in a sense, associated with that, the notion of, you know, secularism? That's right. Yes, yes. No, I, I think the real change came about within Congress. Mm -hmm. in, in other words, the BJP was not nowhere in the picture. Yeah. The real change came about within Congress, Harsima Rao's government mm -hmm. and so on, that, you know, that that that, that was the shift. Mm -hmm. True India was, I mean, okay, that particular crisis you can look at in many ways, you know, uh, which was around the first Iraq war. Mm -hmm. uh, Apparently, lots of Indians wanted to shift their funds to India when the Iraq yes, war happened. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but the Indian banks would not accept them, mm. which was very silly because mm. when we had a balance of payments crisis, <laughs> we actually went to the IMF. Yeah, yeah. Okay, mm. When we went to the IMF, they imposed conditionalities. Mm. Now, even then, uh, we need not have completely changed mm. the, the, the entire set of policies. Uh, because the, that crisis... But was, there was a constituency in India which wanted that's that. That's right, yeah. exactly. Mm. And that constituency was inside the Congress. Mm. Okay. Mm. Uh, when that happened, then of course you, you, you moved to a neoliberal regime and then all these things that we were talking about, mm. namely that, you know, that, that, uh, that it creates, you know, I mean, okay, uh, the coming into being of a relatively more prosperous mm. upper mm. middle class and so mm. on. Mm. Uh, I mean, there's a, there is a kind of process, there's a dialectic that then gets going, mm. which then leads you to the BJP. Mm. Mm. So. so I just want to come back to the Piketty, Chancel, you know, the calculations they do. And one of the things that I actually had made a video on was on 
the bottom 30% of Indians, right? And if you look at the rate of growth of their per capita income from 1951 to 1982, and then 1982 to 2021, mm. which is the data that they had at that time, their rate of growth of income is exactly the same. There's no difference. Whereas for the top 1%, mm. Mm. it was actually flat, mm. slightly negative mm. till 1982. Right. And then it grows at 6.7% per year in real terms. Yes. That's yes. a massive return Absolutely. in real terms. Yes. I mean, you add inflation yes. to that, then it's huge. Mm. Mm. So you can see that huge difference. So how important is inequality? Uh, and this is inequality in enabling the absolute rich to completely capture all institutions. I mean, how dangerous is inequality for democracy in that sense? Yes. In fact, the argument that people like Piketty put forward is that this enormous increase in inequality is fundamentally inimical to democracy, which is absolutely true, mm. obviously. Uh, and and I think we can see the way that inequality, I mean, obviously, if I'm earning a very fat salary and I am a media executive, mm. then I'm not going to go and, 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 and propagate for an egalitarian society. I yes, mean, I would yeah. rather take the position, as mm. we were discussing earlier, that, look, I mean, you know, this inequality is really the price to pay for talent, mm. Mm. Okay, and so on, which is the... Uh, now, so, so I think the... I mean, I think as we were discussing, the change begins earlier, but there's a dialectics of it because of which uh, the growth in inequality further consolidates the change. Mm -hmm. it, it, it consolidates the change in views, the mm. change in ideas, mm. the debunking of the earlier regime, mm. the debunking of all kinds of, uh, let's say, reservations. Mm. Okay, mm. I mean, you know, that, that the Dalits are being pampered mm, because yeah. of the fact mm, that, you know, mm. they really don't deserve all mm, this, but mm. they are being pampered mm, mm. and so on. That, that, that entire mindset, mm. which I would really call a counter-revolution, mm. if you think in yeah, terms yeah. of the freedom struggle, anti-colonial mm. struggle mm. As, as a social revolution, mm. which in many ways it was. I mean, obviously, it was not a social revolution carried as far as the left would have liked. Mm. But one person, one vote is an enormous change yes. in a society. Yes. Like mm. us, that whatever limited uh, land reforms, etc., yeah, were yeah, there yeah, were yeah, 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 were yeah. important. And Absolutely, mm. yes. And 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 the counter revolution mm. gets strengthened because of this. I, I I I'm sure you're not familiar with uh, uh, Hindi cinema, the world of Hindi cinema. Yeah. But you know there was there is a movie called Coolie with ah, Amitabh Bachchan Amitabh. in which he got injured. That's right. right. And the, uh, and the poster of Cooley is Amitabh Bachchan with a hammer and sickle. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, right? He's wearing a red yeah, Cooley yeah, yeah, and he's got a hammer and sickle. Right? So this is 1983 mm -hmm. right? and probably shot in 1982. Of course, in the background of, I think, the Bombay uh, strike. The, right. So therefore, there is that uh, sense. And you come 20 years later yes. and there is Amitabh Bachchan with a look <laughs> and saying that, Tradition is everything. <laughs> so that that change one yes. can actually capture in yes. in public culture. The, Absolutely. The yes. ruling elites change in being pro people to being Yes. Yes. You know, there's a huge difference. Yes. Right? yes. I mean as a if I when I went to school in the eighties, you couldn't really say that the poor are poor because they're untalented. Absolutely, exactly. Exactly. And today it's uh -huh. par for course. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, so uh, one of the things that I want to ask you is that is there any solution to this crisis? Uh, there are two parts to it. One is that, uh, you know, uh, today as I was, I had just written in Tribune about how infrastructure spending actually doesn't help at all. It yeah. has, doesn't yeah. create jobs, it doesn't create anything. Then I actually quickly, uh, I saw that you had written recently about how infrastructure is essentially for the rich. Right? That's right, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. I saw it, uh, yes. I should have, I, I wish I'd read it before writing. But uh, this focus on infrastructure, one thing, that is, that virtually doesn't create anything other than, you know, not even actually profits for infrastructure companies because they're all lo yeah, loss yeah, making. Right. Cement companies do well, but infrastructure yeah. companies don't. 
The other part I want to understand from you, and that we have to wrap up, I guess I've taken a lot of your time, um, is why is there such low labor participation in India? Two different questions, but in some way I think connected. Okay, you know, the first thing I'd like to say is that the crisis of neoliberalism cannot be overcome within neoliberalism. Okay. And it cannot be overcome even by the Hindutva elements who, who mm. are in power, mm. you know, which I call neo-fascism. Mm. I mean, you really mm. cannot have new... You see, there is a fundamental difference between the 1930s and now. Mm. In the 1930s, you had right-wing governments, fascist governments coming in Germany, Japan, and so on. But they did get rid of the Great Depression yes. because they had public spending based mm. on borrowing. Mm. Now, and, and that is because finance was national, the nation state was national. Mm. Mm. While today what you have is the nation state is national, mm. but finance is globalized. Mm. As a result, if you have government borrowing finance spending, mm. then finance is going to leave. So, and, and then In fact, if I'm not it. wrong, when Hitler came to power, he basically stopped banks from repaying the American loans. At yes, one that's point. right. Yes, yeah. yes. Mm. So, so, so the thing is, and, and, and the entire Japanese thing was financed by fiscal deficit, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. so, so fiscal deficit was something which, which was used by the government. Mm. Uh, whether or not domestic finance liked it was immaterial, because anyway, domestic finance was more or less persuaded by the domestic government but today that's not the case mm. that being the that being the case you find that the current crop of governments extreme right wing governments are incapable or you know uh, of of overcoming the crisis of neoliberalism mm. Mm. so our unemployment instead of being overcome would actually become worse and worse. People's living conditions would become worse and worse. And even the prosperous segments in the middle class that you were talking about mm -hmm. earlier, mm -hmm. who are now experiencing relative stagnation, even decline in their living standards. Mm -hmm. So that I think the system is going to, is or is coming to, a, a, again, a kind of dead end. Mm -hmm. Now, when that happens, mm -hmm. then I think you'll have to go beyond neoliberalism, mm -hmm. okay? How you go beyond your, and this is quite obvious. I mean, you know, uh, even Joe Biden, mm. uh, you know, I mean, his uh, uh, many. It seems of the that things, the West is going out faster. The, that's <laughs> right. The, the West recognizes it yeah. because I think intellectually they are more independent mm -hmm. than our intelligentsia mm -hmm. is. Uh, uh, you know and that. Uh, just as Keynes was in his time. Yes. Okay. Mm. So, uh, so, but the while the West. Western intelligentsia segments of it are recognizing that even the Financial Times writes art editorials talking mm. about the need for a, a, a new Roosevelt Keynes moment. Mm. Mm. Uh, they are still thinking in terms of going back to Keynesianism. Mm. They see the need for change, but they see the change as going back to Keynesianism, mm. which I don't think will work. But uh, but you know, uh, therefore, but but I think the. The change is imminent. Mm. It has to happen. Mm. And uh, in India, you see... A, so, it, it, would you put India, the, especially the Modi regime, would you treat it slightly differently? Because, in a sense, this uh, government keeps a certain, let's say, a group of big conglomerates on its side. But at the same time, it tends to spend on things which would get it votes. So... Uh, and in India, it seems to me people are so poor that you don't need much to appear to be doing something for the poor. So is that slightly different from... But, you know, if unemployment increases, in mm. other words, you have a given number of jobs and more and more people among mm. whom these jobs are actually mm. distributed. Uh, if that is the case, then I think, I mean, there is no doubt that, that people's conditions have actually become much worse. Mm. The fact that in 2017-18, the National Sample Survey on Consumer Expenditures, those data were not even released, released by the government. Mm. You know, it's quite uh, interesting because what was leaked in the newspaper suggested that the per capita real consumption expenditure in the entire rural area mm. was 9% lower mm. than in 2000. But there was, a, there, there, there was something to be uh, seen there because if you look at it, 
it said that the bottom 10% had actually got more. The top 10% had gone down by 30% in rural India. Yes, it's, it's, it's perfectly. But on the other hand, there's a huge segment in which between. Which is affected. Yeah, which it. is uh, affected. Affected so, by it. So, so the point is that even though you may be able to ameliorate the conditions of the very, very poor to mm. some extent, mm. like this free food drains and mm. so on. But on the other hand, the mass there's of people. There's a huge overhang. Yeah, absolutely. The mass of people would continue to suffer. What? stops people from even looking for work and, and that's that's what puzzles me there is one thing to say there's unemployment right but people don't look for work why is it that in india uh -huh. the even male labor par force participation rate is so low you see uh, probably lowest uh, in the world. Yeah, but, but I mean, there is a discouraged worker effect that, mm. you know, if it is the case that actually jobs are not available, in that case, people stop looking for jobs. Mm. When you say stop looking for jobs, what you mean is that they stop looking for jobs which are, as it were, captured in the various surveys and so on. I mean, yeah, they, yeah. Uh, yeah, what they may be getting some informally yes. jobs and so on. But no, for instance, CMI collects two kinds of data. One is where they, when they look at those who are actively seeking work, which right. is exactly. technically what they would do yeah. for the labor force. Exactly. But they also do something that if you were offered a job, will mm. you work? Mm. Which mm. they call the greater labor force. Mm. Mm. Only 43% say that if we were offered a job, we would work. So that, that's, the, that's the, the gap between the greater labor force. So I'm saying that there is one thing which is to say that there is no work and therefore I'm not looking for it. But there's another which says, I will not work even if I were offered that. Is that because wages are so low? That the, the work that they can get is so poor that it's not worth going to work. No, it is conceivable that some of these people who say no mm. uh, would be people who are getting some work. Some work, yeah. And But, but you see... Unemployment figures in India mean very little mm, because, mm. I mean, I'm talking on the official unemployment mm, mm. figures. Because, you know, whether you had an hour's work in the last one yes. week, uh, really does, mm. I mean, if you had uh, three hours work earlier mm. and now you have one hour's work, you're still you're employed. You're still employed, yeah. So, so the point is that... And if you lost a construction job and gone home and you're going, uh, come to the, going to the field and sitting there, then you're a farmer. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. So I, I think what actually happens is that a given amount of work then gets distributed among more and more people. That's mm. basically... And the, the hours drop. Yeah, that's right. Mm. Exactly. Mm. That's basically the form that unemployment takes in societies like ours. So it is, I mean, it's, it, obviously it's nobody who's fully unemployed. Mm -hmm. uh, you have some 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 job, mm. uh, but on the other hand, uh, it is conceivable that if you are offered a job, uh, you 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 may say no, not because you are completely unemployed. I mean, if you are completely unemployed, mm. you'd say yes. Mm. But you have got some kind of a job. You may not but wish is to it go. is it possible that anything that you are offered? is simply not worth it because you... It's quite possible. It, it may involve moving out. It yeah. may involve all kinds of things. Mm. Uh, and, and as I said, nobody is fully unemployed. Mm. So to, uh, you know, to end the discussion, uh, to quote you know, the much maligned uh, Marx, where he said that it can lead to uh, the common ruin of all contending classes. <laughs> So are we in a situation where it's a common ruin of all contending classes or? <laughs> well, no, you know, I mean. I mean, I'm taking the pessimist. I, no, no, no. I, I actually take a lot of uh, uh, encouragement from the fact that the farmer agitation was mm. so successful. Now the work workers, for instance, you know, you, you had a convention recently. They are now going to be engaging in massive strike action. Mm. All over Europe, there are mm. massive strike actions mm. taking mm. place. In other words, after a very long time, in fact, almost from the days of the Margaret Thatcher period, mm. you have a revival of working class militancy everywhere, mm. including here, mm. including mm. here. Mm. Here it has taken longer, mm. but on uh, on the other hand, I think there is some revival. Mm. The farmers are, are, are on the, on the war path, mm. and I think the coming into being of some kind of 
of an alliance between the farmers and the workers mm -hmm. is certainly on the agenda. So I, I would expect that actually these days are going to end. Mm -hmm. I mean, by okay. which I don't mean tomorrow or day after. Mm -hmm. But I think we are moving to a conjuncture mm -hmm. in which this change is uh, on the horizon. Mm -hmm. Okay. On that optimistic note, thank you so much, thank uh, you. Professor Patnaik, for giving us your time. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, and uh, do, uh, if you like this video, please press the like button because that's going to ensure that YouTube pushes it out to more people. <laughs> and subscribe to our channel, uh, press the bell icon because then you'll know every time we put up a new video and you know, you're not going to get to watch these kind of videos anywhere else. Thanks a lot for joining. <laughs>